Welcome everybody. My name is Tim Sandy. I'm a senior systems engineer with Cohesity. And in this video, I'd like to go over the user interface of the Cohesity management interface. And this particular interface is version 6.1.1. And this is a long-term solution or long-term supported version. There are newer versions that are out and available to be able to download. However, this is the long-term supported version that most of our customers have right now. So I'm going to provide a overview of the user interface, just a real basic. This is kind of the interface. This is where you go to do some of the basic functions of using uh, our tool for doing data protection and doing recoveries and some initial configuration settings. So this is just meant to be a general overview of the interface itself, just to get you familiar with it. So again, this is going to be version 6.1.1, and this is the long-term supported version. So let's get started. So once you log into the key city interface, you're going to see that we have cluster 01. Now, obviously, you can have multiple clusters and you can use our SAS tool Helios to log into if you have multiple clusters and manage them from a one single pane of glass and do them globally. In this example, this is just a demo environment I have in my home lab. You know, this is going to have some basic configurations in it. So understand that and it's not connected to Helios right now. But just again, understanding the bigger picture when you have multiple clusters and maybe you're connected to instances in either AWS, GCP or Azure to uh, maybe send some cold data out there or to maybe do a restore and to bring up as a DR function from some of your virtual machines. However, you happen to be using and whatever your architecture is for your Cohesity environment, just understand that Helios is the main interface that allows you to connect all these, all these Cohesity clusters together and to manage them universally. So once you get logged in, you're going to see that you're going to get the initial dashboard presented to you on a login. And as you can see, it shows you your protection runs, uh, gives you kind of a status update as to how many runs you have, whether or not you've busted any of your SLA violations, whether there's any errors, any current jobs running. Uh, gives you a list of your policies. You can click on the more to see all of them. It gives you a health status how many critical warnings and nodes with issues. It also gives you an overview of your storage. The storage reduction, this is really handy uh, with your doo doop ratio. So as you can see currently in this test environment, I'm getting a 33X storage deduplication. And as you can see here, logically used 1.5 terabytes. Um, physical used is 47 gigs. So and we see that we have a graph here that we can click on and get some information as well. We have the protection, so we see how many backup jobs that we have, replications, archivals, replications in. Then we have our protected objects, so how many objects in our environment, protecting 23 out of 26, the total size. Now, if you notice that we do present everything in tibibytes rather than terabytes, this is kind of the new trend. Basically, the equation is one terabyte of data equals 1.1 tibibytes. So if you need to make that conversion to understand it, basically just take your terabytes and divide it by 1.1, and that'll tell you how many tibibytes you have. So that's kind of the way the market's going right now is we're doing things in tibibytes instead of terabytes. Not sure why, but that's the direction that we're going. Then we also offer some information on throughput, the number of recoveries in the last 30 days, your audit logs, as well as IOPS. So this is the main dashboard. Also on the bottom here, you know, you got links directly to, to email our support. You have your help. You have a REST API. So for those developers out there that are looking to, to uh, be able to connect and to maybe automate some workflows, they, here is the information on the REST API. You can also download our command line interface as well for those that are more into using command line interfaces. So all you, and then some information on license agreement, and of course, our co main Cohesity public facing page. At the top here, you're going to see the name of the cluster, which is cluster 01. 
And again, we're on the main dashboard, which is where we come in when we log in. We also, if you have connected and protected SQL databases, you also have this SQL dashboard. So going there real quick, you're going to see I have one SQL host with one instance. I got six protected databases, the protected size, how many SQL jobs, recoveries, clones. Again, gives you some nice information on your recoveries. Uh, here is the host that I'm protecting as well as the databases that I'm protecting. And you can see the last successful backup of them. There's three main databases here with the protection policies I have attached to them. In order to back up any databases or any application-based stuff, get that deeper ability to back up not just the virtual machine or the physical machine, and we can do both physical and virtual, it does require an agent, depending on what you're doing, whether you're backing up a physical or whether you're going down to the application level. So as you can see here, we have a link to where you can download the Cohesity agent. I'm going to skip over to the platform tab. Under the platform, you see we have clusters and views. Real quick, I want to kind of cover logically what the breakdown in the logical view or architecture of is of an environment. So we see here is basically the logical architecture. Very simple form of it, but essentially you have a cluster. Within that cluster, it creates a partition in our file system, a single partition. And then within that, so the partition and the cluster kind of go hand in hand. So they're symbiotic in nature. So when you create a cluster, you're creating a partition. And within the cluster and partition, you have what we call a storage domain. The old term that we used to call it is a view box. So if you, depending on if you're looking at some material that's a little bit older, it will reference it as a view box, but the new term is a storage domain. Within that storage domain, we create views. And then as you can see within the cluster as well, we have our cohesity nodes. These are physical nodes. And just like most cluster concepts, whether it be Microsoft's clustering or any type of clustering concept, in order to have the redundancy, the high availability of the data and everything else, you do have to have a minimum of three cohesity nodes within a cluster. We recommend four. So then that way, if you lose one node, you still have full copy and backup copies of your data. So you're still running with redundancy and high availability, but the minimum is three nodes. So I just kind of wanted to give you a quick logical architecture of the Cohesity environment. Not going to get into the details of this concept, what actual storage domains are, what views are and everything else. It's not the focus of this particular video. This is more about the user interface, but because we're going to be looking at creating a cluster, creating storage domain and views, I just kind of wanted to give you a logical architecture overview. So back into the user interface, again, going to platform, we're going to go to cluster. Now you can see here that I have my cluster already. And again, I've created cluster row one. So it comes into the summary screen here where it gives you the cluster name, cluster ID, creation date, the release version of the software, and some other information. Here is where you can configure your cluster. And then if you're going to do an upgrade to the cluster, you would download uh, the update file and then you do the upgrade here. Again, going back to that logical architecture under the cluster, we have the storage domains. That's the next level. So here we have the storage domains. Uh, I've created this default storage domain. So this is where they are. Again, you can have multiple storage domains as we saw in the logical architecture image that I showed previously. Now, this again is a test environment. So this is really just a one node cluster. Typically, again, in anything production in the real world, you're going to have a minimum of three clusters in here. But here's the, the three nodes. Also, if we have configured any VLANs, and then also we are able to obviously encrypt. So we have built in capability, the safe net, which is selected right now to do and act as a key management server internally within the QCD system. However, if you have a third party um, KMIP server in your environment, you can point to that and use that as well. So you can either use our internal safe net 
KMS server, or you can use an external KMIP server that you may have in your environment already. So that is the cluster configuration there. Then we have the views. So here's our default view. And we have a view shares an SMB authentication and global whitelist. And here's just to take a look at our view right now. It shows our default view for our shares and mount points. Our protection, if you have any protection jobs, user quotas, if you've created any, and here's the settings tab. Some basic information here on the file system, quotas and alerts, SMB options, protocols. As you can see for the view, you have a choice between NFS, SMB, and S3. So you can configure it for all like this particular instance, or you can actually create multiple views, one for NFS, one for SMB, one for S3 if you choose to. Going over to the admin tab, we have the access management. So here is where we have the built-in groups that we've created, users and groups. We have the different roles. Admin is basically your super admin with the exception just to point out that the data security user has a special permission that the standard admin doesn't. Uh, the data security allows you, if you choose to run and search data for compliance type, uh, say social security numbers, PII type information, or anything relating to compliance from a security perspective, the data security individual, whoever has this particular role, can run searches against this information that is data locked. And what I mean by data locked is when we create a protection job and back up the data, we can data lock it to where once that has been created, that snapshot has been done, that is now read only essentially to where it'll protect you from ransomware. So it can't come in and modify any, any of the data. And if it's for, again, compliance reasons for PII or other compliance reasons, and you have a, a security officer that needs to go in and validate that there's not data in there that's not supposed to be in there or to make sure it has been modified. Again, that data security rule allows that person to go into data locked material and run searches against it. So just wanted to point out that. Active Directory tab is where you can add, obviously, and connect to your Active Directory, which most are going to want to do. Based on your environment, if you choose to do LDAP, you also have the ability to connect to LDAP for Linux. And then also, if you have SSO configured, single sign-on, you can also configure that as well. And here's where you can also add your custom roles, user groups, add to Active Directory, LDAP, and configure SSO as well. So going to the protection tab, as you can see here, when you're first configuring it, you need to connect to your sources, so such as a vCenter. So let's go to that. So as you can see here, I've connected to a vCenter server, a VMware vCenter server. I've also connected to a NAS. Uh, I've connected to a SQL server and a SQL database. As you can see here, again, you can download the agent accordingly to connecting to these physical devices or application type servers like a SQL database. So this is where you would go ahead and register and connect to them. If you click the register drop down here, you can see you can register to different hypervisors such as VMware, Hyper-V, KVM, Acropolis. You can go to a physical server when you want to register Microsoft SQL cluster. Oracle servers, you can connect to peer storage arrays, a NAS, and then also snapshot provider. So there's your options as to what you can register from a source perspective. And as you can see, I've got a couple of registered here already. For environments that are larger, uh, you can connect again to multiple remote cohesity clusters. And again, manage them from our Helios SAS interface. So here's where you can do that. And also external targets as well. So you may want to register, say, to either AWS or GCP or Azure to either archive data out there or maybe to have it as a DR function where you can spin up your backup copies of your virtual machines instantly for DR purposes, whatever your intentions are. But here's where you can register external targets. And as you can see here, you know, for archiver, you can archival purposes of data tiering. So if you want to archive 
uh, cold data, so that's where the tiering comes in, you can um, set the parameters and archive data that hasn't been accessed in so long, which is cold data to maybe AWS, for example. But for external sources, as you can see here, you have different options for AWS, Glacier, S3, S3IA. You have Azure, Archive Blob, Cool Blob, Hot Blob. You have GCP, Cold Line, Multi-Regional, Near Line, Regional. You have Oracle, Archive Storage Object. Then you also have NAS, QSTAR Tape, and S3 Compatible. So those are different external sources that we can connect to. Again, we don't have any in this demo environment here, but that's where you would go ahead and connect to them. So that's kind of connecting to any type of resource, whether it be an external source, remote cluster, external target. Next up, we're going to cover protection jobs, policy manager. Let's go to policy manager real quick. Policy manager here, when by default you come into the interface, out of the box, you're going to see a bronze, gold, and silver policy that's set up. The, the retention periods and the backup schedule is going to be a little bit different. I have modified these in this particular demo environment and also added some additional protection policies as well for non-critical VMs, for database and such. So here's where you know you can create your policy, call it what you want, set up your backup schedule for how frequently, how long to retain it, whether you want it to be an incremental or incremental full every so often, add log backup, especially for databases. If it's a bare metal restore backup, a physical server, this is where you can modify that. You can modify extended retention periods, retry options, blackout windows. Also, if you want to replicate to another Cohesity cluster, or maybe you want to replicate out to a cloud instance again, Azure, GCP, AWS, archival, same thing. If you want to archive to another cluster or to an external source. And then cloud spin is our ability to be able to uh, like I mentioned earlier, where you have a DR event and you have some backups of your VMs, you can do a mass restore out on the cloud and spin up, say, 100 VMs all at once from those backup snapshots. And you can do that instantly. So from a DR perspective, it's a incredible way to be able to do that. Or typically from most backup type solutions to restore 100 virtual machines is going to take a long time. It could take hours, days to be able to, to complete that with most backup technologies. So that is creating a protection policy. We looked at policy manager. Now, if you're looking to recover something, here's the different options. You can do recovery of files and folders. Uh, the great thing about that is the way we do indexing on everything globally and even within your virtual machines. So if there's a file within a virtual machine that you need to restore, you can do that with our recovery of the files and folders. You can do a full VM. You can do a physical server. You can do, again, SQL databases, SQL servers, oracles, instant volume mounts, as well as a, an entire storage volume. And then we have the Cloud Retrieve here. So what Cloud Retrieve is the ability to back up to archive to a public cloud storage, so such as Amazon's uh, S3 storage buckets. We can archive data to there, but then we can restore from those external targets back into our Cohesity cluster on premise. That's where we can go ahead and do a cloud retrieve or restore from a cloud environment when we're archiving out to those external cloud providers. And then finally, we have the monitoring tab. So here we got performance. So again, this is going to give us uh, any alerts. Again, it, we can select different clusters if we have multiple ones. We can select the date. We can look at certain time periods, whether it be 24 hours, 7 days, 30 days. Again, it gives us alerts, throughput, IOPS, latency, and CPU and memory. Keep in mind, this is just a demo environment that we're in here right now. So going back to the monitoring tab, then we go to storage. This will give us all our information again on storage. You can select what cluster we want to look at. If we have multiple, it gives us a breakdown of the global storage reduction. 
uh, storage capacity, logical data managed, cluster storage used, cluster storage available. Again, gives you the graph of the storage reduction with a graph and timeline that you can look at. Going back, you can look at alerts. So it shows our recent alerts, how many we've had from a timeline perspective, alert summary, what they are, and also a resolution summary as well. So then we also have reporting that we can do within the Coicity UI as well, which will give you information on all the data that you have. We not only globally dedupe and index the data, but because we index the data, we can also provide a lot of reporting on that data globally. So both Coicity clusters on-prem as well as any data that you have out on those cloud providers that I mentioned. We also have audit logs especially your security individuals in your environment. They're going to be interested in any auditing. If there's something that happened, you need to check who did it. It will let you know who has performed a certain task within the environment. As you can see here, you can also download it to a CSV. And then also, and finally, in the monitoring tab, we have advanced diagnostics so again we have multiple different selections information that we can do for schema the metric that we want to do against what entity roll-up function you know is it an average is it a count a max a minimum what the interval was interval in seconds again because we're managing this data globally not only can we do the reporting but we can also do diagnostics across all the data as well the last tab here that we haven't touched upon is the more tab and going into test and dev. As you can see, we have the ability to clone our views, our virtual machines, as well as SQL. Now, what this does and who this is really for, especially and why they call it test dev is your developers constantly modifying their code on their applications, on their servers, and they want to test it out. So what we can do is we can go ahead and clone actual production systems or clone any VMs that they happen to be working on. And then we can spin up these clones and then they can test it. So this is great for test dev because uh, typically they want to have something that mirrors the production environment. So you can literally do a protection job for your production VMs, run a backup of it, then clone those and spin them up and your developers can update them and run them. So the basically exact duplicates of the production servers, except for with those modifications that they may have done to the code or what have you. So you're getting a real world duplication of the environment. This is awesome for your developers, especially. So that's why we kind of call it test dev. And then under more, we have Workbench. These are tools that we have, again, in mind, I said that we're able to manage, access, report, and look at data globally. So whether you have multiple clusters on-prem and or if you're connected to some external cloud providers like AWS, Azure, or GCP, we have these tools that we have provided internally to the system. The first one is a video compressor. Let's say that you're a company that is a security company and you and control customer video surveillance systems. So you're storing a lot, eats up a ton of storage space, obviously, because video is huge. We give the ability of using this tool to do a video compressor. We can go through search the system for videos and video files and compress them down. So now we're reducing the amount of storage that you're using for videos. So for anybody that stores a lot of video, this is huge password detector for your security team. Maybe they want to do searches for pass, you know, weak passwords. Our passwords don't meet these requirements. We have that tool to be able to do that, that we can run again against all that data globally. And then also from a pattern finder. So if you want to look for social security numbers, any PAI type of information. So from a compliance standpoint, to ensure that you're not housing any PII information or anything else, you have this tool to where you can do this pattern finder tool to be able to search the data. Now, keep in mind, this is something where you're going to clone the data and then you're going to run it. It is going to take a while, especially the bigger environment that you have to be able to find this. But it is a great tool, again, for those compliance and security officers. And that's something that is internal. 
You're also going to find in our newer releases that are not long-term supported quite yet, that will be shortly in the future, we're also going to be able to add other applications to run on our Cohesity clusters. So for example, we could run Splunk directly on the Cohesity cluster. Rather than bringing the data to the application, we're actually bringing the application to the data. Performance standpoint, everything is just phenomenal. So just something to think about there. Finally, uh, in the top here, we do have a global search. If it is a uh, global search, again, across all the data, no matter whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, it is a Google search. Uh, if you know anything about our company, our founder is Mohit Aaron. He was the lead developer of the Google file system. And then he became... Uh, owners and uh, he was the creator of Nutanix for hyperconverged storage. So a little bit about our owner, but he was the one that developed the Google file system. So this is basically a global search capability. Obviously you have a help page here. You also get your alerts here. And then finally your profile of whoever you're logged in with. So again, this was just meant to be a very quick overview of the Cohesity user interface, and this is version 6.1.1, which is currently our long-term supported version. And I hope this kind of gave you just a, a quick and basic overview of the user interface, what is available in it, what we can do with it, how to manage your Cohesity environment, both your on-prem Cohesity cluster, as well as if you're connected to anything out in Azure, GCP, or AWS. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed this video and was helpful to you.